Here! It's over here! I think I'm too weak. No. I will give you strength. Come. Where? The coffin has gone. For God's sake, where? Vampires are intelligent beings, General. They know when the forces of good are arraigned against them. It's me. To my home. Carilla! Take me with you! Satana! Apage Satana! Well, all right, you ignorant pigs, put down your crack pipes and your beer bongs. It's time for Agri Tabletop Nerds Night at the Movies. This night's offering from Beyond the Pit is The Vampire Lovers, 1970, starring Sir Peter Cushing, Ingrid Pitt, Madeline Smith, George Cole, and Kate O'Mara, directed by Roy Ward Baker. Now, Roy Ward Baker is known for doing The Scars of Dracula in 1970, not to mention that delightful movie The Monster Club, starring Vincent Price, the king of all monster movies, and John Carradine. Based on the book by Sheridan Le Fanu, Carmilla, 1872, 25 years before Bram Stoker's Dracula. Let's check it out. So out of the entire Hammer Horror catalog, uh, the vampire lovers might push Dracula Has Risen From His Grave out of the number one spot. Both movies are really good. They're both neck and neck, even though Dracula Has Risen From His Grave is its own story that doesn't necessarily use the book itself. Um, this, uh, this movie is many a blueprint for an Anne Rice novel, not to mention it gives way to the sexy vampire, the concept of a sexy vampire uh, instead of a disgusting corpse without a soul, like in the song by uh, Merciful Fate. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, nine years later, there would be a movie called Dracula starring Frank Langella, and again, he kind of puts Dracula into a sexual... Uh, how do I say this, handsome, desirable character rather than a disgusting corpse that feeds off of the blood of the living and becomes younger, which is how uh, Bram Stoker wrote his novel. In 1992, they would re redo another Dracula movie with Gary Oldman, and they follow the book somewhat as written, more so than any Dracula movie ever made. And um, it, it's just really good and it also makes the vampire look sexy which would probably which would dictate vampire movies all the way up until the uh mid and late aughts that's how vampires would always be sexy and you know Anne Rice would do her thing you would have Queen of the Dam starring Aaliyah which you know a lot of people don't like you know I I give it to Aaliyah you know I just I just want to watch the movie because she's walking around in almost nothing and the way that she moves tight little dancer's body, you know, again, giving rise to the sex, the sexy vampire. Ingrid, Ingrid Pitt easily dethrones 
Uh, Veronica Carlson is the primo hammer horror babe. Not to mention Madeline Smith is very attractive too. I believe that the movie was offered to uh, Veronica Carlson, but Veronica Carlson refused to do any nude scenes. And uh, that's just that's just her, you know. She didn't she didn't want to have like kids and then say, "Hey, we saw your mom in this movie," you know. Whereas, I, I think it would have been okay in this movie because this one movie is uh, it, it it isn't smut. It's almost an art film in the way that they pull off the nude scenes in this movie, you know. Uh, but she does uh, she does supplant Veronica Carlson. Like, you know, Veronica Carlson had the top spot. She also did a movie for Hammer in 1970 as well. But, you know, it's just one notch above because, you know, what are you going to do? So the movie itself uh, starts off with a prelude, which does not happen in the book. You go right into Carmilla and uh, you learn about what happened to Laura, the niece of the General Spielsdorf, way later in the book um, in a letter from General Spielsdorf to... Uh, uh, Mr. Morton and Lo and uh, Emma. So um, you, he starts off about how his sister is killed by Marcilla and uh, the von Karnstein family. And that's with a K and an N instead of Kars Karstein, like in Warhammer. Now, if you're a Warhammer fan and the name Karnstein means something to you, well, where do you think they got the name for von Karstein? Um, you just take out the N and you start the... Uh, name with a C rather than a K. And, you know, if, if, uh, you read this book and, uh, you know, and the Warhammer lore means anything to you, it just sort of writes itself after reading this book. And this book is really short. It only took me about four hours to get through it and everything, you know, and I've read, I've read the book at least three times, very short story and, uh, very well written as well. And uh, if you uh, go to the the setting of the story, it takes place in Styria, southern Austria, or Slovenia. Now, if you add a Y and take out the O and add an A, you get Slovenia, home of Manfred von Karstein. You know, and from there, uh, you know, you watch this movie, the way that it's photographed and everything, and you look at the 6th edition Vampire Counts Codex, you get a lot of those uh, connections uh, to the... Um, Warhammer world there and that's a, that's a nice touch because a lot of the guy a lot of the guys who would go on to write for Warhammer during its golden age they did grow up on a steady diet of hammer horror films and that is very prevalent in the 6th edition vampire rulebook and uh, just in some of the terrain and the way that things are photographed with the graveyard the spooky black coach all of that is hammer horror one of the things that this movie does right is that it follows the book as written. Now, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. If you do comic or book as written, you have one hell of a great film. Case in point, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, 1990, quite possibly one of the best, if not the number two, best comic book movie ever done. Just flat out ever done. It had the right amount of humor. It had the right amount of darkness. It had the right amount of grief and suffering. It, and it was, uh, it's just really much a masterpiece, a lot like Spider-Man 2, which between the two uh, movies and the two comics, they're both really, really neck and neck with how things were done. Our setting is also the uh, late 1770s and early 1780s, and it's a grand party, and um, Carmilla and her, I want to say another vampire show up to this party, and... Uh, he starts, uh, uh, this woman starts talking to the General Spilsdorf in the book, and this is following the book very well, and uh, an emergency writer comes up, talks to the, talks to the uh, Countess, and then she has to leave, and she has to travel all night, and the General Spielsdorf, Spielsdorf, played by Peter Cushing, offers his services to take care of Ingrid Pitt, or Mercarla, as she is named in this arc, um, as a favor to other nobility. Now, that's what you did because it, in the book, it's kind of described that it's a very lonely place where they live. There's there's a small town, then there's the uh, Castle von Karstein, an abandoned town, and then there's a couple of schlosses, and then there's the town. There's not, and if you're kind of upper class in that part of Styria, you know, there's just not a lot to do for noble women, so having company is a welcome thing. 
you know. And whenever this Black Rider appears, he appears in the book too, but way towards the end. Whenever it appears, he's a future harbinger of uh, vampiric moments. Not long after they take in Mercarla uh, with General Spilsdorf and Laura, Laura appears, uh, the uh, Black Rider appears every time there's a vampiric moment. Sorry. So at the start of... Uh, at the start of this, uh, Laura starts to have dreams of a big gray cat. And each time she has this dream, it ends with Carmilla, I mean, Mercarla. The vampire illness begins to set in, and um, her condition is written off by the doctor as anemia. You know, and then um, they cut back to a scene between Laura and uh, Mercarla that kind of ends in le lesbianism, but you don't know. They kind of leave it to your imagination because it cuts out and cuts away very quickly. It, it starts a lot of this, a lot of the good things about this movie and in the book is that it starts off with a lesbian connotation and then it leads you to, to say, is this feeding or did she go down on her? You don't know. And I really think that every time, uh, Mercarla comes to Laura. Yes, it starts very innocently enough, but it ends very gruesomely with a feeding. Laura becomes devoted more and more to Carmilla through the nightly visits and everything. And like a drug addict, a person who is being cannibalized by a vampire comes to rely on these feedings, much like an addiction to drugs. Now, I don't know if this is a hammer rule or a rule from some other part of the vampire lore, but I, I want to say it's a hammer rule. When uh, when the vampire starts feeding on a victim, they become addicted to it and they need it. Um, I've already mentioned the big gray cat ending with Mercala, and on the night that Laura dies, you know, they, they look for Mercala, she's nowhere to be found, and then all of a sudden, like Dracula, she appears, announces that Laura is dead, the doctor shows up, he starts his examination, goes to check her pulse, and notices two puncture marks on the middle of her breast, just like in the mo just like in the book and in the movie. After this discovery, Mercarla reappears and then disappears. And all you hear is uh, the General Spielsdorf yelling her name throughout the mansion as she's nowhere to be found because she disappeared. She goes back to the graveyard at the castle von Karnstein and disappears into the mist like a ghost. And um, again, this is like, uh, if you're a Warhammer fan, this is like the Lamian vampire, you know, just coming out of the graveyard, reappearing. You know, you have a lot of these uh, supernatural powers come from both of these books, uh, uh, both Dracula and and Carmilla, you know, and that's one hell of a first act. Next, you again meet Emma, who is Laura's friend, and Roger Morton, the Morton family, who was a Englishman who served in the Austrian army, and because of his pension, he could live very cheaply uh, by, by British terms at the time in Styria. And uh, th this is where the book and the movie kind of uh, take place. You know, they have their... Uh, you also meet the uh, the governess, uh, Mademoiselle Paradeau, who is the nanny to Emma and everything. And she, they talk about the three people in their household. Not They mention about how the household is empty and there's never a lot of company. So they go out for a ride and while they're riding their horses, there's a carriage accident. Now this is word for word the book and the movie working together. And you meet the same countess with Mercarla, except for this time her name is Carmilla. And uh, she needs a place to stay because they're on a they're on they're on their way to see the dying brother of the countess. And again, Roger Morton, like the general, offers his services to watch over the young lady. And again, she's excited to have the company. And it's the same bullshit rule ruse to stick the vampire with a beautiful young victim. Now, in the next scene, Emma and Carmilla are getting acquainted during a very steamy bathtub scene, and. And this is very, uh, very innocent. You know, she disrobes in front of Carmilla because she's told, you can't wear that. You have to take your bodice off because it, it, the dress doesn't work with it. They're trying on dresses and they're already acting like sisters. And the, you, you know, you get the feeling you get from Emma is that she wants to explore being scandalous. And so she gussies herself up in a dress before dinner. And of course, back in polite society, dinner was kind of like the last meal of, a day, of the day. And it was like a miniature party. For the nobility, you know, because only the nobility back then got to eat. 
Now this this makes you uh, this is what makes Carmilla so dangerous is because during an innocent moment during the bathtub scene, Emma is hypnotized and seduced. And again, you cut away. And you don't know if there was a, a, a vampire's kiss or if she went down on her in, in, in lesbianism. You don't know. And the book is very good at alluding to that as well. You know, there's always that cutout that leaves you to draw your own conclusion. You're like, oh, man. You know, it gives it. You know, one of the good one of the good things that this movie does right is that it follows the the three things that you need for a, a successful horror movie. One, give the audience something to think about. Two, give them blood and death. And three, send them home with a heart on because it's mostly young men who were into horror. The, you know, back then. Now again, the Dark Rider appears, and the nightmares of a big gray cat as big as a gray wolf, begin to manifest themselves inside of Emma. You know, and then the next morning, when uh, Carmilla wakes up and she's offered eggs, she says, no, thank you, I'm not hungry. And I think that's a really nice touch, the way they wrote that in there. And um, two peasant girls go missing. In the book, it's three peasant girls. Uh, they, I think they allude to a third in the movie and everything. And this makes you also think, because again, a good horror movie will give you something to think about, as well as try to scare the pants off of you, does Carmilla love her victims? Is she trying to bring someone else into unlife with her? Does the death of the peasant girls represent Carmilla trying to stave off the hunger in order to give uh, the uh, in order to find a moment where she can sneak away with Emma? And take her into unlife, you know, and it, it, they do a real good job of uh, just leaving you to draw your own conclusions in some of these scenes. The big reveal is when Emma talks to Carmilla about the dream itself, and she says, there's a big gray cat, it holds me down, and then I can't breathe, and then you show up, and the cat turns into you, you show up, you hold me, you kiss me, and then I feel the life just sort of drain away from me. And it kind of denotes this uh, lesbian feeding session. The nanny who lives with the Mortons is also under Carmilla's spell as the story progresses. Because uh, uh, now one thing that they did differently in the, move, in the movie is that Morton goes away on business, the dad, and then it's just the two women. in the. It's the governess who runs the household while uh, Roger is gone. And then you have the butler there to keep to kind of keep things in check. And uh, during, a, during a night after one of the nightmares, there's a moment between the nanny and Carmilla where, the, where Carmilla is enthralled by the vampire. And uh, she's there now to rebuff outsiders key, and undermine the butler, Mr. Renton, as the signs of sickness begin to manifest even harder inside of Emma. And Renton learns about vampires while at the bar... And uh, he comes into the, he summons the doctor uh, after a conversation with the bartender, and then he comes into the room with garlic flowers. And these appear to repel Mademoiselle Perado, the nanny, who wants nothing to do with the flowers. And he, he, he he's suspected that the vampire is Mademoiselle Perado because nobody would ever suspect Carmilla. You know, vampires aren't beautiful. They're disgusting corpses. And he, he already has work issues with the governess in general anyway because he's supposed to be in charge while Roger is gone. But, you know, they're always having this kind of power battle. It's a it's a work it's kind of a work a workplace scuffle between the two. On the way home, the doctor is ambushed by Carmilla. Roger Morton returns the next day, and then the movie becomes a race to save Emma's life, much like in the Bram Stoker novel, where at the end of the movie, you have a bunch of guys racing to the castle to save Mina's life. It's a race against time once the vampire has baptized you with vampire's blood. All right, and then uh, he run he runs into uh, the general and Baron Harthog. Now in the book, it's a guy named Wartenberg. There is no Baron Harthog in the book, and they have the body of the doctor, and they're on their way to Castle von Karnstein because uh, the the Baron suspects that he did not kill all of the Karnstein family while he was there in his first outing, and he still wants revenge. While, the, while Roger is away, this is when Carmilla seduces the butler and uh, 
he, he, he's after being seduced, he removes the crucifix because Carmilla couldn't feed that last night to take Emma away because she was repelled by the crucifix. So finally, the garlic flowers, the crucifix are removed. The young guy, Carl, who is not in the uh, book at all, is dispatched to the... Uh, to the castle in a race to save Emma's life. Now, Carl is just, uh, he could be a bastard son of the lesser gentry, and he's given a great degree of uh, freedom to have a job as a property manager or something like that. And since there aren't a lot of eligible bachelors, he's considered, um, he's considered uh, because of his bastard status, half nobility. That's the, kind of the vibe I get from him. He races back, and uh, by this time, the butler's enthralled, he's dispatched with, and... Um, Carmilla comes to uh, Emma and says, I'm going to take you away from here. And when they're marching out, Mademoiselle Peridot comes out and she has a Renfield moment. Now, like in Dracula 1931, uh, Ingrid Pitt walks up that stairs very slowly, whereas like Bella Lugosi was walking down the stairs and ends the life of the servant. And this is the big monster reveal. You know, in the older movies, one of the things that they always give you is a good monster reveal. Uh, the uh, fly with Vincent Price is famous for that scene where the um, hood is taken off and you reveal the guy has turned into a mutant and that it was like, Near the end of the movie for that one reveal where they have to destroy this uh, guy in a press because he's turned into a fly. And he goes down there and the reveal is it's to Emma and uh, Mina in the movie where, uh, yes, this is a monster. It's a vampiric monster. And, uh, of course, uh, she starts praying. She faints. And then Carl shows up. He confronts Carmilla. And uh, it, it's just one of those scenes that's just done so well. She takes the sword out of his hand, and then she's, uh, Emma starts to pray. Carl reaches for a knife that's shaped like a crucifix, and he chants at the vampire, Apage Satana, Apage Satana, which is away with you, Satan. I'm loyal to you, master. I'm your slave. Don't kill me. Let me live, please. Punish me, torture me, but let me live. I can't die with all those lies on my conscience. Ah! Ah! And then uh, uh, Carmilla disappears from the mansion, reappears in her grave, and like in the book, uh, the General Spielsdorf and Wartenberg or Baron Harthog and Morton discover the body of the young woman inside the grave. They take the body to the chapel, and that's where Peter Cushing applies his Van Helsing vampire extermination trade. This movie is pure hammer gold. Like, there's no other way to describe this movie. Um, you know, it, it just delivers in every single aspect of the golden age of Hammer. I, I mean, I, I want to say that, you know, this is probably one of the top five Hammer, best Hammer films ever made, if not probably the number two or the number one. You know, I've seen a lot of Hammer movies. I haven't seen all the Hammer movies, but God, this one is just, it's up there, you know, and it, it also shows you that, you know, women can be villains too. And Ingrid Pitt does a very good job in that final scene where she is revealed as a villain. So this movie, The Vampire Lovers, is just so underrated and it needs to be brought into the light and uh, hosted by Joe Bob Briggs or Elvira. I would even take, I would take Sven Gulli if he could uh, show this on public access. I think he could get away with some of it, but not all of it. This is just one that needs to be hosted by Sven Gulli or Joe Bob Briggs on The Last Drive-In because, you know, it's just so underrated. You don't see films that are this good because most hammer films are cheesy but this one isn't that cheesy you know and so with that said i really hope that the drive-in picks this one up for a one-off special maybe on amc where they can get away with the nudity or something like that but let's get to those uh nerd totals we have five buxom horror babes six decent sets of knockers one case of sexy ingrid pitt and silhouette nine dead bodies three stakes through the heart one decap oh two decapitating strikes, three cases of vampire sickness, four cases of vampirism, garlic foo, crucifix foo, 
Um, two cases of seduction, the butler and the nanny, not to mention swordplay and one steamy bath so, bathtub scene with Ingrid Pitt. Slayer Pitt awards go to Peter Cushing as the general spiels Dort for doing things the hammer way. Ingrid Pitt as Carmilla. You can't wear that. You have to take it all off. And Douglas Wilmer as the Baron Harthog. Vampires are intelligent creatures. They know when the forces of good are arrayed against them. Angry Tabletop Nerd gives this movie five skulls. Check it out for the month of Valentine's Day and maybe rent this one on Valentine's Day. You will not be disappointed. Anyway, let's get to a little bit of housekeeping. So I wanted to do a battle report this weekend, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, I did uh, I did a game, but it was so short and so over with so quickly that it just wasn't even worth reporting. Um, I had three miscasts, four failed leadership tests, one successful de-spell, and uh, I did not cast a successful spell on two dice with a plus three at all. Nothing worked, it, and it fell. And you know when I when I only get one chance to play a game, you know I have to get it right the first time. And if I don't get it right the first time, well, then, you know, this is why I'm not in the big boys league, you know, where they actually have, you know, 12 hours to play three games, three to four games to get it right until you have a desirable result. Or maybe it was just me, you know, I don't know. Anyway, as you know, uh, if you want to help the channel out, you can always subscribe to me on my Rumble page. Rumble's link will be in the description below. If you want to talk to me about the next horror movie I should talk about and discuss, because for all you newcomers out there, this is something that I do. I didn't know if you knew this. If you've uh, watched some of my back videos, I like to talk about horror films. This is basically a YouTube channel where I talk about my hobbies, my adventures in kickboxing, Warhammer, horror films, sometimes a little bit of heavy metal, and uh, this is just something that happens. So for all you newbies out there who have uh, signed up, that yeah, this will happen, and this will be all that you get in the month of October, because I always do a monster fest. And... Um, so uh, th there is that. Uh, don't forget to check this video out on Rumble because that'll also help me out. Leave some likes if you watch it. And uh, always remember that one Rumble like is worth like five YouTube likes. And then um, if you want to shoot the shit with me, Instagram is in the description below. Uh, you can always talk to me over there. Ask me any questions. I'm pretty good about answering those DMs. I try never to leave anybody hanging. Uh, of course, if you comment on YouTube or Rumble, I do check Rumble from time to time, and I do try to answer all of my YouTube content co comments. So, anyway, in case I don't see you, keep painting, keep fighting, keep watching horror movies, especially Hammer horror movies, and uh, dream this Valentine's Day uh, of Ingrid Pitt. That's who I want to get my Valentine's Day kiss from, Ingrid Pitt from The Vampire Lovers. And we'll see you in the next one. Even you, puppy dog. Hey, you need to grow a sack!